Thank you uh, very much uh, for giving this opportunity. Um, so I, I'm just uh, like to add uh, that um, my background is actually, I, I have a master in, in food chemistry and engineering and I'm also inside very passionate about the food technology and, and, and food uh, production. Uh, although I have also chose some path uh, to continue also with the focus uh, with the plant breeding. So I have PhD in plant breeding, but I've been working with the plant proteins for most of my life. So here comes, uh, I'm surprised Milena, but we have very similar interests and uh, I think we, we should collaborate more in the future. Okay, uh, so, so today my talk is about the hidden structures of the processed plant um, uh, foods. And uh, what I, do I mean with these hidden structures? Uh, I, I think I would like to talk a bit to repeat what Milena said and what was said also during uh, two days of the workshop that uh, we should follow actually a researchers, uh, industry, uh, also uh, as food consumers, we follow certain uh, food trends. And as you may know, I mean, this protein hype, protein rich food is, is actually been in, in focus for several years. Um, people want to eat more healthy foods, more to, to drink more uh, healthy drinks. Um, even um, um, as Milena was showing, uh, rapeseed uh, milk, or we know very well actually Oatly, that's a good example of, of this representative product uh, that has taken um, a lot of focus from consumers. As well as we also dream about the, the, the food actually will be health, uh, uh, well, as a medicine for us for, for uh, solving some problems, uh, for instance, um, have certain functionalities, as well as we strive for um, replace meat and, and, and find uh, a good representatives. But here I would like also to bring some provocative uh, um, questions, learning from Elena's talk, <laughs> because we, we also talk about the, uh, we need more proteins. Uh, and if we compare protein uh, products, uh, how much of protein do we have in meat? We have much less protein compared to protein, plant protein based foods. And uh, what is the reason? What is the, why do we need more proteins? We actually from, with few proteins, we can produce textures and structures that look like meat. So this is actually very simple understanding uh, that we need to, to learn more about the, how we can explore plant proteins in different uh, food products. And, uh, as coming from University of Agriculture, we also deal with the different, uh, uh, well, hot uh, topics. As, as you may know, climate is actually can steer very much our food patterns as well as production of food um, together with sustainability and together with the trend that we also want locally produced and, and self-sustainable products. So uh, this is a short introduction uh, to what I uh, would like to, to stress uh, further and uh, um, yesterday we heard uh, Richard from Oakley uh, pointing out that the whole chain is very important and 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 here I would like to bring you 4R so-called uh, chain. I call it 4R because we we want to to choose the right crop. We want to choose the right variety even go down to on the variety level and to do a right processing in order to produce the right food. So then, of course, everyone would ask, "What is right?" It depends on the on the target. It depends on the uh, on the focus. Uh, but um, in each situation, it has to be right for specific purpose. Uh, we work uh, with the food protein systems, and and today and and also uh, yesterday, we heard a lot that we have uh, differences when we work with the more refined uh, system when there is a protein isolate or if we take the whole uh, flour when we have uh, many components, uh, including protein, starch, fibers, and so on. Uh, so um, to repeat that the genotype, what type of the variety you choose, it can play a really um, a different role, what type of outcome or what type of food you can get out. Uh, also in the way, how do you cultivate that crop uh, together? Um, if you aim for specific uh, component of the of the um, uh, of the plant, the extraction process is really crucial. And then we heard a lot, a lot of examples that industrial extraction is really uh, damaging, aggregating the protein. Protein is losing the native properties, and you can't 
can do much uh, with that protein, although uh, native behavior is always more preferred. So how to deal with these challenges in, in the industry, how to deal uh, with it uh, today? Okay, we try to also incorporate processing and if we, uh, we try to, to play with different uh, uh, additives, processing techniques in order to mask or to compensate this uh, structural changes induced by, uh, for instance, uh, different extraction processes. So uh, the target um, of our studies have been mainly in focusing on proteins and protein changes, plant protein changes, uh, when we produce different um, food products as well as non-food. Uh, also, uh, we've been working a little bit uh, on, on, uh, how, on uh, structural changes and uh, morphology uh, of starch and, and the fibers. And the interesting part is actually how these uh, components uh, of the plant, uh, well, of the plant, they are interacting with each other while they are processed. Okay, I would like to bring some food examples that we've been uh, working lately and uh, um, for representative crops um, that you probably heard about uh, and, and wheat is, is actually we chose as a model crop we've been working with wheat for a very long time we, we know very well the system the system protein system is very complex is insoluble it aggregates easy and uh, and, and uh, also um, cause some uh, processing uh, issues uh, pea is a trendy uh, trendy crop uh, because it's of these nutritional aspects, um, as well as, um, as you see in the market, there's quite many uh, pea products that are already uh, taking over. Although personally, I, I just bought another day pea pasta and I had actually, after cooking it, I had to throw away because the personally, uh, the test, taste and smell, it just was awful. So I think we have to keep in mind that, uh, um, well, I think Tommy was also uh, putting in the comments that the taste is really important uh, in this context as well. Um, so uh, to put up, um, so here we have also lupin. We have also actually outstanding a crop, but we, um, well, exotic crop with we barely can grow here in Europe, uh, although it comes uh, all the way from, South America from Peru quinoa uh, is a golden crop uh, known by uh, by ancient our um, ancestors that it contains very attractive nutritional profile and uh, what does it happen with if we process such uh, such cereal into uh, we treat with the high temperatures what does it happen actually with the proteins and other components and lupin uh, Yes, it's attractive due to its uh, ability uh, to replace soya. Uh, so research questions actually, well, is the chemistry, what, uh, what's playing the chemistry behind the uh, different processes? Uh, as processes that involve the different additives, uh, different processing conditions. And uh, well, actually what happens on this molecular scale, uh, on, I mean, the interactions and, and what kind of a, uh, structures that are driving the functionality of this product, uh, this product focus. So this has been uh, quite uh, uh, primarily uh, focused in most of our studies. And uh, to highlight uh, the uh, structures that are on the molecular level, we used the uh, synchrotron techniques, uh, primarily a uh, small angle and a wide, wide angle scattering to elucidate uh, uh, differences on, uh, on uh, different levels in, on these proteins. But how do we started actually uh, to work with a, with a bio-based film. So protein rich film that is in the cartoon is, is made from gluten. Uh, gluten that has been uh, processed using the chemicals, um, additives, uh, I will come here. You have the uh, uh, the graph showing the thick line in um, uh, the thick spectral line that's showing the um, gluten together with the with the chemicals that they uh, actually uh, induce these intriguing structures, induce formation of intriguing structures that we never observed before. So uh, learning from this system, uh, we uh, actually been actually curious to 
to understand why these structures are formed in this particular, uh, for instance, system and how these structures are continue uh, forming if we change, for instance, uh, different uh, genotype. So the one uh, on your left is a genotype that has more disulfide bonds. It's a weed gluten um, extracted from that type of genotype. Uh, and um, on the right side, you have the less cysteine having genotype. What is interesting here, so you have a different rowing uh, inputs to produce these genotypes. And we were also uh, interested how these different growing inputs, uh, beside the temperature, there is a nitrogen input, how these uh, growing inputs induce uh, differences on the nanostructure. So you see a lot of uh, mm, curves uh, and a lot of arrows. Uh, I just don't want to, to go too much into details, but the on the left uh, spectra, uh, the red curve, you you see the uh, black arrows indicating hexagonal structure formation, uh, while the green arrows pointing at the lamella structure. So in this type of system, we observed uh, two different uh, uh, arrangements in, the, in actually um, gluten uh, films. And that, of course, is, is interesting how these structures are correlating with the uh, tensile properties. So the one indicated then and the, with the bars, it shows clearly the, the very different responding behavior in terms of the elasticity model uh, mo modulus of these two films. So here's an, an example showing how genetics can play a role as well as the growing factors. Uh, we move on again with, a, with another uh, non-food sample. So this is the last non-food sample that I wanted to, to, to show you. Uh, we blended in the proteins together with starch, we extruded it, into composites, and we looked at the uh, how the nanostructure of uh, proteins uh, is changing with the uh, pro with the composition of the blend. So the bottom uh, curve is, is showing the nanostructure of the gliders, and uh, it's it's nice to show here that this hexagonal structure is still remaining through. Um, through the um, difference of, of the blends, when the starch is building, the, the, the structure is still intact. So what can we learn from that? That the protein is in some way uh, acting as a matrix as, uh, and actually playing a, a fundamental role. And if you introduce starch, you, you still don't break that arrangement um, uh, in the system. So now we move on to food examples. And uh, here I would like to, to give the, a few examples on the porous snacks that we produce through gliadin proteins. Gliadin, as I said, we, we would love to work with gliadins because they, they form these nice structures. And here's X-ray tomography showing the uh, uh, two different images. They are probably difficult to distinguish by eye, but the, the difference between them is that one is, is actually produced uh, with no enzyme, uh, just a protein, another is with a transglutaminase uh, treated protein. And uh, uh, this is thanks to collaboration with Steve. Uh, and uh, we observed uh, that there is, in, by introducing a transglutaminase, of course, one is expecting that the proteins will get crosslinked. But uh, beside that, we also observed the porosity. Uh, differences in porosity uh, and the sizes of the of the bubbles formed. So the down curve is, in, is showing the uh, higher and bigger sizes of the bubbles. Um, the snacks microstructure, we also observed that in these particular uh, samples, we also had a different interfacial uh, structures, microstructures, as you can see pointed out with the yellow uh, arrows, no enzyme having the more um, more irregular structure while enzyme treated has um, kind of sheets uh, holding bubbles together. And when we come to the uh, scanning um, SACS pattern, we, we also compare the effect, the enzyme effect. So as B6, this is specific transglutaminase enzyme is not commercial. It's enzyme that we produced um, in our, or in, in, in the collaborator's lab. And we compared how the glidings are impacted by enzyme concentration, the first graph. So 
there is a slight uh, shift in the, in the scattering pattern uh, with the in, in, increase in the enzyme concentration. Um, if you compare, while the glycerol is actually uh, uh, giving no effect, the glycerol together with the enzyme is, is actually no, um, in introducing no structural changes. So the, the pattern looks rather similar, which means that the glycerol in some way is actually contributing uh, to, to protein aggregation and actually uh, not allowing enzyme to perform uh, its function. Uh, we move on to, to another additive, which is a very, I think, interesting linoleic acid uh, uh, effect we, we wanted to show in the samples. But the idea to introduce this um, additive was to, uh, um, to in increase the uh, nutritional value of the, uh, of the snacks. Uh, actually, the um, scattering curves showing that uh, no only gliadin no additive is actually having the, um, well, rather simple simple uh, scattering pattern while there, there are additives, there is simply barely differences are between the uh, mm, no enzyme and enzyme having samples. Uh, again, showing that uh, on the, on, if you look at the uh, scattering pattern on the right, a very clear uh, linoleic acid pattern that is actually linoleic acid is not incorporated in the uh, protein network and it's actually uh, sitting it, uh, as, as, a, um, as a component in the structure. Uh, lupin frozen cast films, we also uh, uh, intrigued uh, how these, the structural dynamics is changing by uh, introducing different additives. So if you um, look at the A uh, picture showing no additive, just lupin protein isolate, uh, besides to mention that this lupin protein isolate has been produced by dry fractionation. Uh, although um, with the idea uh, to, uh, to, con to make the as high as possible lupin uh, isolate uh, later to be used in, in different foods. Uh, while in, in B uh, image, you see the introduction of the um, transglutaminase. Uh, in C, you see the introduction of transglutaminase and lecithin. And in D, you see uh, linoleic acid and, and um, actually enzyme. So um, there is uh, quite a dynamic uh, change in, mor in morphology of these films, uh, as well as in the microstructure. Um, with the scanning electron microscopy, we were able to, uh, to see that the structure works was extremely fragile. As you could see, it's a bit messy image on A, um, in, in A case, but you could able, we were able to distinguish the pores, the lamellas, uh, as well as the um, actually specifically formed bridges between lamellas in the lecithin case. So it's again, um, and, and what actually we can learn from the microstructure, we can learn the, the certain uh, level of the, uh, how ingredients um, together with the, with the proteins interact, but on the um, nano level, which is shown in this uh, graph, we compared the, um, the impact on the nanostructure of, of these different uh, additives. And uh, well, in the glycerol case, we, we see that there is, uh, well, commercial um, in the first black curve indicating the uh, uh, commercial uh, enzyme uh, slight impact, uh, while in the in the sub following uh, curves uh, we see no really not not big influence of the uh, glycerol and enzymes uh, used. By the lecithin case, we with the enzyme uh, we see the the, the violet uh, top uh, curve we see. Uh, some um, structures, uh, some nanostructures formed uh, due to enzyme and, and protein, uh, while in the case of the uh, transglutaminase uh, and linoleic acid, we see very clear pattern of linoleic acid, uh, profound, uh, well, actually formed and, and actually uh, buried in this structure. Uh, so, uh, 
This gives us more understanding how we can uh, play with different uh, systems. And in this case, uh, in the case that I showed, it was with Lupin, uh, but as well as um, uh, I think playing with the more refined system is, is, is giving more clarity uh, while here we move on to more complex sample as it is, we have the quinoa. Um, on the first image you have quinoa seed uh, following image we have flower and that flower was extruded into the so-called uh, uh, Peruvian actually uh, national food. Uh, it's actually pellets um, or, or, or flakes and uh, these these flakes were dried in the in the high temperatures. So we're, to, we're curious to see what's happening with the proteins and the uh, nutritional components during processing. Uh, and the proteins, uh, the top uh, graph is showing the, uh, is it from HPLC, the, the green graph is showing the protein pattern uh, uh, as it is extracted from the flower. Uh, and it shows uh, an, a different type of proteins while the proteins very clearly aggregate in the, in the curve below that uh, after processing. So uh, the extrusion, although was not very high temperatures, but still uh, impact uh, severely the protein. Uh, this actually could be, uh, we compared the microstructure of the proteins, um, not the proteins, sorry, the, the extrudates, and uh, the one on the on your left is uh, actually extrudate as it comes. The one on your right is extrudate that it has uh, post processed with the temperature, which means that it has been drying at a high temperature for a very short time. From outside, you see the color differences. From inside, uh, or, or actually uh, just color differences, but uh, they look very similar. From inside, as you could see from this microstructure, they look uh, entirely different. Um, the one on the left is very compact, uh, on the one on the right is very porous. Uh, from nutritional profile, so the, the, one of the questions is was, what is happening actually if we use the high extrusion temperatures, how the this uh, super serial uh, nutritional profile is affected. And uh, by our big surprise that uh, only methionine and, and cysteine have been reduced uh, while, in a, while other uh, amino acids, they still kept uh, quite, uh, uh, quite good numbers after, after extrusion. So uh, this is rather, well, I think it's important information to learn that uh, you still can, um, can do or play with the processing and, and rather high temperatures, but you still don't affect in, in severely the nutritional uh, composition. Uh, again, another, well, similar information as has been obtained with the, with the uh, of these samples, we looked at the, with the X-ray tomography. And I think uh, here is only new information is from the profile picture that, uh, that you can see the structure um, distribution through longitude direction, the, the, the sample on your right. Uh, so uh, what is happening on the nanostructure on level uh, of these processed serials? Uh, and uh, here actually is, is pretty complex. Um, a pretty complex spectra uh, to, uh, uh, to interpret for the protein part because we can't tell much about proteins, but at least we can tell about the uh, starch. So the, the top down two uh, curves representing the grain and flour, while the other top three uh, curves representing processed materials. So, so the, the extruded, uh, extruded dried and extruded grinded material. And there you have a different examples of different starch crystallinity. And if we look closer, what happens with this starch crystallinity dynamics, uh, we can actually uh, understand from the study that uh, crystallinity, um, uh, degree of crystallinity is changing. So here we have a, a crystallinity, which is around, uh, not around very specific, very uh, exactly 29%. So if we apply extrusion, uh, we have a decrease in crystallinity as this obvious decrease in, in the uh, peaks. 
uh, and we have a decrease up to 8%. But if we dry this material, if we dry this food, we have an even further decrease and further shifts in crystallinity um, of starch. Um, we move to, to other uh, very brief example of the pea protein. Uh, an idea with this was to uh, also uh, by fractionation method to produce protein rich fraction, uh, fiber rich fraction, uh, blend them together uh, with a, and process using the temperature. Um, here we have the initial, I think uh, it has, been met, has not been mentioned uh, during the um, during the, uh, this workshop, that the importance of the particle size and, or the, the importance of the, beside the purity of the fractions, the importance of the particle size is playing a very fundamental role, how these ingredients are blended further in the food. And uh, we, we kind of got the fraction from our collaborators uh, from University of Copenhagen. Um, we found it well, we looked at the microscope and we were very surprised. They called it fiber fraction, fiber rich fraction, although it was filled with a lot of starch after frictionation process. And uh, this starch was very well uh, acting as a filler in the matrix in, in the processed, uh, uh, processed food. And uh, of course, it was contributing uh, to, to different functional properties, uh, to the stretchness. Uh, as you could see, the protein uh, isolate uh, uh, sample was, was much more elongated compared to the uh, fractions uh, where the proteins and, and, and fibers were blended in, uh, while hardness was no in influence at all. Uh, so this information uh, can help us understand what is happening on the, on the microstructure, on the secondary structure uh, using FTIR method. Uh, and uh, that if you have only proteins, we have a domination of the intermolecular beta sheet structure formation uh, versus alpha helix. And uh, this goes on for all the, uh, let's see, this is in proteins, this is in the blends. And then we have uh, actually only fiber, there is no such uh, secondary structures are presented. So uh, it's another additional information to understand the system and it's, it's, it's rather helpful. Although uh, for, for SAC's part, uh, I still put the question mark, uh, it's one of the, uh, could be possibilities to understand what happens with the uh, protein fiber interaction, but we should not forget we have starch there, uh, we have a shift in distances, for the protein isolate uh, or protein uh, yeah, isolate, we have a, a lower distances while we have a blend, we have a higher distances, how much we can learn from uh, protein fiber interaction uh, interpretation is, is still rather, rather complex. So we need to learn a lot uh, how to interpret this data again to, to break down. It's like, like Lego, right? I mean, you, you, you build some, you have something built and then you have to to put it down to the pieces and then try to, to work with the piece and, and add piece by piece and try to build the understanding of structure. So uh, to conclude, um, for instance, quinoa is extrusion, uh, well, has been extrusion processing uh, using the trend temperatures between 69 and 95. So was still surprisingly fairly good temperatures to to, to play around and, and still not damage, for instance, nutritional uh, aspects and still get the, the, the product uh, well processed. Uh, although that we can't avoid the, the, the using temperatures and, and can't avoid pro, um, protein cross-linking and aggregation. So we have to live with it. Uh, and, and, and that's what we, uh, um, we have to keep in mind. Uh, as well as the porosity, uh, you can play around uh, with the proteins and, and, and different uh, additives. You can play around also with the porosity and different type of morphology, as we've been uh, uh, observed uh, by, uh, we observed that with the scanning electron microscope and X-ray uh, tomography. Uh, as well as decrease, if we want to, to play with the starch crystallinity, it decreases it. Uh, this is one of the examples. 
And uh, I didn't mention that, uh, but uh, the starch types has been changed during processing. So the, the type A turned into type e, V uh, starches, and that was observed using the wax technique. Um, and uh, extrusion is still good uh, processing uh, versus roasting and, and still nutritionally attractive. So future prospects, I think is good to, to, to highlight that is uh, controlling the structure of the plant components is, is uh, important. It could be used as a tuning uh, functional uh, element in, in producing food, uh, as well as a deep understanding uh, plant components uh, using the uh, techniques, synchrotron techniques, together in combination with the other uh, methods, I think could be a very good approach to understand and, and more explore protein, protein, protein starch and protein fiber interactions, as well as uh, produce new, uh, yeah, new ways of, of uh, trying to, to tune food for specific properties. So uh, I would like to thank collaborators, colleagues, uh, funders, uh, Max Fu Laboratory for providing beam time and uh, industry partners uh, as well as you for your attention. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ramona. We have time for a very quick question if anyone has before uh, break. We are two minutes over. Any thought? I'll just ask you a quick question, Ramona. You started uh, the presentation. It also goes a little bit to what Melina was saying that we, um, I, I understood that you said that native behavior of proteins are the preferred behavior, but you do see that you get a difference after extrusion, but the nutritional was not so bad. And I think also Melina said that sometimes we have to uh, destroy, so to say, the protein because we have to have uh, heat systems. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean with uh, the problem problems of native or non-native proteins? Yeah, I mean, uh, that was also talked, I think, during the, well, in Milena's talk, and I think in several other talks that, uh, for instance, uh, spray drying is a very harsh processing method, and you never get the protein in native form. So uh, you, you simply introduce changes and uh, that's what we ex explored in the lab, you know, to work with the gluten is, is rather easy because you can easy wash it by hand it from, from flour. So you just use a, sim simply make a, make a matrix, uh, make a dough and then you wash under the water and then you, you, we analyze that, that structure and we compared with the industrially produced gluten and when we saw uh, much uh, more native properties of gluten, the one that was produced in the lab, uh, meaning that um, proteins are more uh, prone to interact uh, and form the, the polymers. The polymers are important for functionality, uh, while, um, and it's the same with the potato protein, it's the same with other proteins. So, but I understand as well as the industry can't throw away machines, they have to use the machines that they use but probably they have to play with a bit with tuning uh, and, and, and trying. I mean, I cannot give the answer that, um, well, we have to, to, to use it to, to throw away uh, and, and use the native way of, of making proteins, but I think it's good to keep in mind uh, what, what kind of functions you would have with of protein if you would not um, introduce this, uh, well, modifications during extraction and processing. So let's say trade-off, I mean, trade-off depending on the, on the, um, yeah, on the uh, focus uh, as well. So yeah, you have to find some, somewhere compromise. And I think that's what is industry struggling and doing. And, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.